You know, we as a, a church, we're going to do these things and, and make our lives better here. That there's an eternal perspective. And something I think that we here in the 21st century can forget sometimes is that we get so focused on the now that we really don't care about the then. We, we get so focused on living our lives and doing our thing and that we don't stop and contemplate at some point Jesus is going to come. If you look at the geopolitical things and prophecy of Scripture, you, you can't help but think, could it be today, could it be tomorrow? I don't think we think enough about that. We don't, we don't think enough about the return of Christ to make a difference in our lives right now. I, I don't think we do. A couple weeks ago, we talked about when is Jesus coming, and we, we talked about from the Scriptures, at least from my perspective, it could be any second, it could be any day. Um, I think the reminder for me is not just the return of Jesus, but it's also something could happen to me today. We don't like being morbid and we don't like thinking about that, right? But something could happen to me today and that I won't have a tomorrow. And with a perspective like that, that, that makes things ominous a little bit, doesn't it? It's where in Ecclesiastes, Solomon writes that it's better to go to a funeral than a party. Well, why? Why? Because there, there ought to be a sobering reality someplace in our existence that there's more than just today and we ought to, we ought to be doing the things that are important, right? We, we ought to be spending time doing the things that really matter and, and not just wasting our time. The passage that that song comes from is in Matthew chapter 24 and I want to use it as a starting point for us to go through the rest of the New Testament. We're not going to do all 27 books this morning, all right? Don't quite have enough time for that. Amen? No. All right, maybe we will. We'll take a break for lunch. All right. Um, but I think this is a good starting point for a survey for us to say if, if this is important, if the return of Christ, either me going to see him or him coming to get me is important, we ought to take a look at it. It ought to be something that is, is on our mind regularly. In Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 36, uh, Jesus had been spending this whole chapter in discussion with the disciples. And he says this on, in verse 36. It says, Now concerning that day or hour that no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son except the Father alone, as the days of Noah were, so are the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way that the coming of the Son of Man it will be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding grain with a hand mill and one will be taken and one left. Therefore be alert, since you don't know what day your Lord is coming. But know this, if the homeowner had known what time the thief was coming, he would have stayed alert and not let his house be broken into. This is why you are also to be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. There's a, there's a sobering thing in that, right? I think sometimes in church, and I've read a couple articles in this past week that, that confirms that not just in our locality, but even across the country. We in church in America are so focused on personality and prestige and, and popularity and uh, the number of hits our social media gets and the number of people sometimes sitting in the seats that we forget that there's a whole lot more that we ought to be focusing on. I don't need to focus on my entourage and people buying my t-shirts. I, I don't, but they are available in the lobby after the service. <laughs> Probably not. First of all, my wife would give me that look, right? Like, and it's amazing how the voice of God sounds like my wife. So I wouldn't do that. But uh, we in church, we focus on so many of the wrong things. That where, is it, where is it in here that we focus on, man, I want God to do something in my life so incredible that only he can get the credit. And then I want to see God do something in the lives of the people around me. Where, where, do, we, where do we do that? Um, too often in American church, we say, hey, I have a great church. I have a great church. You need to come to my church. we we'll talk about our church, but we don't talk about Jesus. You can probably hear in this area, you can talk about your church all day long, but once, once you mention the name Jesus, it changes the conversation. Even people who don't go to church 
feel the weight and power of the name of Jesus. Man, when I, when I think about it, I think about his return. It could be soon, it could be any day. Or I could step off this planet tomorrow. I'm not planning on it. I, my, my plan is to, to you know, have my kids, both of them get married and get to hang out with my grandkids because that's the reason I didn't kill my kids when they were young is because I have grandkids. Some of that, that's funny. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm being joking, I'm not serious. But I've got a plan for my life. I don't, I'm not planning on, on leaving here anytime soon, but I, I could leave tomorrow or Jesus could return tomorrow. And so if that's the case, and I think one man left, one man taken, the, the return of Christ comes like a thief in the night, I, I need to rethink my stuff. You never hear at a, when someone's you know, in, on their deathbed, you know, someone knows that they only have a day or two to go or a week to go, you never hear them say, oh, I wish I had spent more time at work. You, you don't. And you don't see a U-Haul hooked up to the back of a hearse. Nobody takes the stuff with them, right? So if that's the case, we as God's people, in light of the return of Jesus, or in light of, I could, I, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. In light of all those things, I need to pay attention, in light of those things, to say what I need to say, and to do what I need to do. It sounds really simple, but it's hard having those conversations we need to have, doing some of those things that are just the tough things or whatever else. In fact, this is not just something that we as Christians feel. People in our culture inherently feel that. It's that eternity written in our hearts is what it says in Ecclesiastes, that God has imprinted the Imago Dei, the image of God, on every one of us. That built into here someplace is that connection with the God of the universe, and we can't fill that in with anything else. We, we try working, we try relationships, we try, you know, a thrill, we try all these different things, and it does not satisfy because God has put his imprint on us. So someplace in here, you and I need to take, take this stuff seriously and to begin to remind ourselves and think, what do I need to say today, and what do I need to do today, all right? So uh, I was... As soon as Kayla comes back in, you can send her up here, because that would be cool, because Kayla is going to sing a song that might be familiar to you, um, but she stepped out of the room. All right. So as I keep going, when she comes back in, send her up, up here. The first thing I want to, want to uh, point out to us is that we need to pay attention to say what we need to say and do what we need to do in the first area is in the area of relationships, in relationships. Don't we usually say... Yeah, that's right. Don't we usually say that, uh, man, I wish I had said something to that person. I wish I had not missed that opportunity to, to, to um, voice these things. Because now the time has passed, or that person moved away, or this relationship is broken, or this person passes away, and I didn't get to voice the words that needed to, I, I needed to say something. In fact, in our culture, it says that, you know, people understand that. And John Mayer wrote a song, and Kayla's going to sing just a little bit of it for us um, as a reminder to say what we need to say. You might hear that in the lyrics. Man, the one time you try to go to the bathroom in this place. <laughs> it's okay. That's how timing works. So words like that can come from our culture. That, that John Mayer, I don't know that he knows God. I don't know that he has a relationship with Jesus. But someplace in here, the cry of our heart built into every one of us is that kind of stuff, is that kind of message. 
No, the two things I want to emphasize with us is say what we need to say and do what you need to do. I guess that's what, why Kayla was late. <laughs> Doing what you need to do. <laughs> Couldn't help it, sorry, it's just right there. It's just... Please edit that out of the video. Okay. Listen to this passage, okay? In Luke chapter 12, it says, someone from the crowd said to him, uh, uh, no, let, let me do the Romans chapter 13 first. Let me do Romans passage. Listen to what this says. See if, see if this could be you. In Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, and then we'll go on down to verse, uh, chapter 13. Romans chapter 12. See if this is a list that, that you can do that you can say or do in relationships. Watch this. It says, For the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he should. Instead, think sensibly as God has distributed a measure of faith to each one. Now, many of us have same parts. Uh, going down to verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Detest evil. Cling to what is good. Love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lack diligence and zeal be fervent in the spirit serve the lord rejoice in hope be patient in affliction be per persistent in prayer share with the saints in their needs pursue hospitality bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse rejoice with those who rejoice weep with those who weep live in harmony with one another do not be proud instead associate with the humble do not be wise in your own estimation do not repay anyone evil for evil. Give careful thought to do what is honorable in everyone's eyes. For if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it's written, Vengeance is mine, or vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in doing so, you'll be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. As long as it's up to you, and if t today we're going to be your last day, how are you going to treat relationships and deal with other people? Are you going to be dismissive? Man, I, I think about, you know, my dad passed away uh, a year and a half ago. And in the couple of years before he passed, you know, my dad was not a part of my life for probably 30 years. Uh, there was a strained relationship for a whole lot of reasons. And when he finally came back into our universe, it was very difficult. He was an angry, bitter old man. And we tried loving him and being gracious to him. And there were several times in that little bit of time that he was living in my house that I had almost every conversation with him I need to have, needed to have. When he passed a couple years later, I, I, I had no regrets. I had no remorse over what I should have said and didn't. Because you know how it goes. That's a finality. When someone steps over to the other side, you, you can't have, go and have that conversation. You can't go and try to work that thing out. You can't go and fix that thing. If, if I knew that, that tomorrow were my last day, what, what conversations would I have differently with people? What, what things that need to be said now that I haven't said. If I knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow or if I could die tomorrow, what would I say to someone? Can you think of that person? I see some, some of you have a, have a fearful look on your face. You know the relationship and you know the conversation you need to have. Some of those are hard ones. Some of those are thank yous that you've never said. Some of those, I, I, I can see it on your face. Some of those things are the conversation that you should have had a long time ago but you haven't. If today were your last day, what conversations and, and stuff would you have with people that would be different if Jesus were coming back? You know, over in Matthew chapter 6, he gives us a, a little picture um, in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 6, it's at the uh, end of the section that Jesus is teaching the disciples to pray. Many of you know this part. Therefore, verse 9, therefore you should pray like this, our Father in heaven. You know, I always want to do it in Old King James. I memorized it in. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Verse 14, and this is the part that gets me every time. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Who thought God had a conditional part in here? But someplace in God's economy, in the relationship with other people, God, it's that, you know, that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, soul and mind, and strength. The second part's like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. There is a, there's a connection in our relationship with God and our relationship with other people. That if we are unwilling to forgive others, how much does God want to not forgive us? He's not going to take your salvation away. Salvation is sealed in the blood of Jesus. You, you can't earn your salvation. You can't keep your salvation because it's not based on you. It's based on Jesus and what he has done. But there is something of the relationship with God that could be hampered or hindered because we don't stop and forgive others their sins against us. So if I knew that today was my last day or tomorrow is my last day or Jesus is coming back today or tomorrow, if I knew that, would it make any difference in how I forgave other people? Because at some point I'm going to stand before Jesus and he's going to say, I forgave you of all that stuff and that stuff that you did more than once. I forgave you. How did you deal with other people? Wow. In light of his return, it ought to be a motivator to us to be able to forgive others as he has forgiven us, it says in Ephesians. That's a big deal. If I take this return of Christ stuff seriously, or, or man, I, I could go tomorrow. Do you feel the weight of that? I'm just standing here, even just thinking about it now, and just feeling all of a sudden the weight of the responsibility of timeliness of taking care of my stuff. That I need to say the things I need to say. Who is someone to whom you need to give a thank you? Is there somebody you haven't talked to in years? I, I had some, some folks do some of that kind of stuff last night at a gathering for my son Caleb and, and his new bride. There were folks who said public thank yous and public honor and blessings. And, and it, was, it was a cool thing. Is there somebody in your life that you, you need to do that? Maybe someone you need to thank your parents. If you're a teenager or a college student, it's probably you. <laughs> Teenagers and college student, the universe revolves right here. Uh, have you thought about somebody you need to thank? We need to pay attention to this stuff in, the return, in light of the return of Christ in our relationships. The second thing, we need to do this in, in, in the area of our finances. Look over at Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Jesus telling a parable here, he says, someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Can you imagine the audacity going to Jesus? My brother won't share. I mean, that's what he was, that's what he was doing. Verse 14, friend, he said to him, who appointed me judge or arbiter over you? He then told him, watch out and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. When he to then he told him a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. And he thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I'll do this, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and goods there. <laughs> it doesn't say that, but I think that's in there. <laughs> and then I'll say to myself, you have many goods stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. <laughs> I mean... Sorry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. The things you have prepared, whose will they, they be? That is how it will be with one who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. If Jesus is coming back tomorrow or you are going to pass, how important is your money and your stuff? A friend of mine was telling me he, he went on this trip with some, the, his brat pack, his several couples that do stuff together, and they all went on this trip. And, and all of them are very successful people. They, they have their uh, retirement accounts and this and that, and, and there's nothing wrong with planning ahead and doing those things well. 
But in the conversation of these people saying, yeah, we'll spend you know, two or three months in Florida and two or three months in Arizona and we'll go to our other place and we'll do these things, not one place in the conversations he was having anywhere in there is, yeah, and with some of my resources, I'm going to make a sizable investment in the kingdom of God. But it, it was almost as if in the financial planning of someone for the whole, you know, my whole retirement, my whole thing, the, the thought that I'm going to give and make a significant investment in the kingdom for those who are coming after me with my resources was nowhere in the plan. What we know to be true, economists tell us that the biggest transfer of wealth in an American history is taking place right now with the baby boomers and, and those before them. You know, the, the money they saved up and investments and this and that, because they are passing away, that, those resources are changing hands. And Uncle Sam, a relative I never asked for to take my money, he's getting his percentage. And yet people in their planning don't take the opportunity to make sure that, that they honor God with his. Now, not a commercial, but a cool thing. With the Missouri Baptist Convention, there's a foundation that, that can help people walk through their, their end-of-life planning and all that kind of stuff, or retirement planning or whatever, and they walk through and they help people plan out, how do I make um, God-sized investments in the kingdom as I'm planning for my future and those around, you know, those who come after me? Some of us spend so much time on, on what is going to happen to me after this and after this that we don't stop and think about it's all, it all belongs to God. I was in the trailer over there. I was making my way back to the back of the trailer, appreciating the air conditioning. And I heard the Sunday school class. And actually, I got to stop in that little Sunday school class where the two little boys in that Sunday school class gave money in the class. It, it, was, it was cool. Both of them... You know, put their money in, and, and I'm not sure they realize how important that is. But from the time that I was 16 till now, for the most part, there were some times I ended up having to go back and pay God. You know, God, I owe you a little, right? But the first 10 cents out of every dollar goes to Him. And I work real hard, and I do my stuff, and I, I take care of my things. And, and I, I don't want to plan for the future, and I have insurance, and and, and, and uh, Proverbs says a man who, uh, uh, a wise man sees trouble coming and prepares for it. So I want to do the wise things and do the right things. But with my money and my resources from the time I was 16 till now, it is so important for me to take the resources that God has given me and be able to put them in the hands of someone who's going to continue ministry to somebody else. Because it's not all about me. Now, I don't need to consume every penny in my life for my own ease and comfort and satisfaction. That someplace with my resources, I ought to be making an investment in the kingdom of God. If God takes me out tomorrow, my wife still you know, goes on. I don't have a, a big estate to give to somebody, you know. But reading the book of Ecclesiastes is interesting. Solomon, the wisest guy who ever lived, said, you know, we work and work and work and work and work and we get all this stuff and we save up all this money and we do all these things and then we die and we give it to somebody who doesn't work. Isn't Solomon right? We give and we leave all of our stuff to somebody who's not really grateful for what it took to get all this. Wow. Wow. Solomon understood that over 3,000 years ago, yet we have a hard time understanding that now. If I could just get some more, if I could just do this or whatever, we as a culture, we like to, as I heard say a long time ago, we like to get all we can, we like to can all we get, and we like to sit on the can. Because it's all about me and it's all about my stuff and it's all about my satisfaction and happiness and ease and comfort and safety and et cetera. In light of the return of Jesus, I'm going to have to give an account for every penny. In light of the return of Jesus, either I go to see him or he comes to get me, I'm going to have to give an account for how I spent my money. There is more time spent in the New Testament and in the book of Proverbs spent on money than it is just about anything else. Why? Because where your heart is there, your treasure will be and vice versa. And how we spend our money is a picture of our relationship with Jesus. Go back and look in your checkbook. Go back and look at your calendar. How have you spent your time and how have you spent your resources, your treasure? You can look at it and say, is God really a priority in my life? When I stand before him, he's going to, I have to give an account for every idle word and deed. 
What, what am I going to do with that? I don't need to, oh, I'm so fearful of God that I'm going to do these things. No, out of reverence to him, he loved me first, he loved me best, he loved me most, that with my time, talent, treasure, and testimony, I'm going to give freely back to him and make a difference for somebody else and not just for me. But we, but we don't do that. If we truly had a picture of the return of Jesus or the brevity of life, man, I... I I would think that our perspective would be better in our time, in our relationships, and in our money. Don't, don't you? Uh, I, along those lines, I've spent a lot of time with college students, specifically in the past couple of years, teaching college students, and then with my own boys and all their friends. And there are so many of their friends that don't take the time to say, God, I have a career path. What do you want me to do? I don't know that that's a common thing that we do in church anymore, that we talk to young adults and say, hey, you have your whole life ahead of you. Not just what do you want to do, not just what are you good at, what does God want you to do and what is he calling you to? You know with the word vocation, right? The word vocation is that Latin word for call. What is your calling? What is your work? What is your vocation? Uh, not everybody's called to stand up in front of people and speak, right? But each one of us, whether we're a, you know, we work in a school district or own our own business or a stay-at-home mom or whatever our, our place is that God has called us to, that is to be honorable before the Lord. God, what do you want me to do with my time, tra talent, treasure, testimony? What do you want me to do as a job? I'm going to have to give an account. Now think of this, if Jesus comes back tomorrow, are your relationships taken care of? Have you asked for forgiveness? Have you offered forgiveness? Have you given honor to whom honor is due? Have you given the words that are necessary? And your finances. If you're to look at your finances today, are my finances honoring to God? And if I'm gone but people are still here, are they honoring God to the future? And, and the bigger stuff. If Jesus is coming back tomorrow... Where are you with him? You know, back when I was in high school, you know, there was more Bible prophecy stuff and people talked about the return of Jesus and all that kind of thing. And the, and the phrase sometimes our youth pastor would say is, you don't want to go to that rated R movie because what if Jesus shows up right when you're in that rated R movie? <laughs> Hello, Lord, you know. <laughs> Anytime I went to the movie theater, I thought about that after. What, are Jesus concerned about what movie I'm watching? Well, well, yeah. Look over with me at, at um, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. There are several passages in, in the New Testament that are pointing to the return of Jesus, and they, and they sound something like this. 1 John 2, 28 through chapter 3, verse 3. And it says this, it says, So now, little children, remain or abide in him, so that when he appears, when he shows up, when he's coming, or you go to see him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. For if you know he's righteous, you know this well, everyone who does right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has given us that we should be called God's children, and we are. And the reason the world does not know us, because it didn't know him. Now, dear friends, we are God's children now. And, we, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him as he is. Verse 3, highlight circle. And everyone who has this hope, what, what hope? That Jesus is coming back, that he will return. Either I go to see him or he's coming to get me. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself as he is pure. What does that mean? That means all the stuff that, that looks like sin all the stuff that is not honorable to God, all the stuff in my life that's like barnacles on a ship, all the stuff that, that I allow in and entangle me, I'm carried away and swept away by my own sin, lust, and desires, all my stuff, I need to be willing to put that aside and be able to honor him when he shows up. When God shows up, it, it, it's game over. When he shows up, we'll stand before him at his judgment seat. We don't talk about that in church a lot. This is a whole missing section of Christianity. We will stand before him and we will give an account. And, and you know what? In the time I have between right now and when I go to see him or he comes to get me, Lord, it is all yours. I hold nothing 
back. The biggest problem in my life between me and God is me. It's the guy in the mirror. Your biggest problem in your life between you and God is you. You are only as close to God as you want to be. You can't blame it on the people around you. You can't blame it on your job, how busy you are. We, we got kids or I'm retired or what. You can't use any. There's no excuse. You're only as close to God as you want to be. And in light of the return of Jesus, that is a motivator for us. I mean, look, look over here at uh, 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Um, We'll even go chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter writing this kind of stuff to, to the, the general church all over the known world at the time. He says this, Dear friends, this is now the second letter I've written to you. In both letters I want to stir you up to sincere understanding by way of a reminder so that when you recall the words previously spoken by the holy prophets and the commander of our Lord and Savior given through the apostles, Above all, be aware of this. Scoffers will come in the last days, scoffing and following their own evil desires, saying, where is this coming that he promised? So ever since our ancestors fell asleep, all the things continue as they have been since the beginning of creation. They deliberately overlook this, that by the word of God the heavens came into being a long time ago and the earth was brought about from water through water. Verse 6, through these the world of that time perished when it was flooded, and by the same word, the present heavens and earth are stored up for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. What is all that? That means Jesus is coming. People say, hey, time's gone on. Where is this Jesus? That Bible's not true. Jesus said he's coming back 2,000 years ago, and all you guys have still been waiting for him. You're waiting for nothing. Never going to happen. As things were back then, they are now. Jesus is not coming back what he's saying verse 8 dear friends don't overlook this fact that with the Lord day, one day is like a thousand years a thousand years one day the Lord does not delay his promise as some understand a delay but he is patient with you not wanting any to perish but all come to repentance but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and on that day the heavens will pass away with a loud voice the elements will burn and be dissolved in the earth and all the works in it will be disclosed and since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, it is clear what sort of people you should be in holy conduct and godliness as you wait for the day of the Lord and hasten its coming. Because of that day, the heavens will be dissolved with fire and the elements and will melt with heat. And based on this promise, we wait for a new heavens and new earth where righteousness dwells. Peter writing to the people of the church at that day, he's like, look, some people say it's never going to happen, but I tell you, it's going to happen. And you ought to be people who are different. You ought to be people who act different. You shouldn't be like everybody else and doing the things that everybody else does. You ought to be a people, and some people say, you ought to be a peculiar people. That's what the one scripture says in King James. That, that sounds like today we'd be calling us strange. <laughs> there are some people that I have gone to church with in the past that are strange. I'm not saying any of you guys, right? But we ought to be different enough in our lifestyle and our words and the way we treat people and the way we deal with things, the way we raise our kids. We ought to be different enough that people on the outside say, they sure are peculiar. They're a little strange. They don't let their kids do this. They don't let their kids do that. My boys, they're like everybody else gets to do it. And what would we say? We are not like everybody else. Why? Because we have standards of holiness and righteousness, not beating our kids down and not beating up the people around us. But I will give an account for everything I do and say before the Lord. And in light of his return, is it going to be today? I don't know. It could be. Can you imagine the trumpet sound, the trumpet call, the voice of angels, and the eastern sky opening up, and everybody who has their faith, trust, and hope in Jesus, whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life, will be caught up in the air with him. And oh, what a glorious day. The next seven years will be a seven years of hell, literally, on earth. But those who are followers of Jesus will be caught up to be with him. Will that be you? And if he catches, you're caught up in the air with him, and we stand before him at his Bema seat, his judgment seat. And it's not a seat for salvation, it's a seat for rewards or punishments. We stand, or see for rewards. We stand before him and all that we do are put, 
you know, on the altar and burned, and the good things are gold, silver, precious stones, those stay behind. The wood, hay, and stubble burn up, and all the stuff you've done in your life are put on here and judged and evaluated before God. What, what's it going to look like? I can't help but think, when that day comes, I, I want to be ready. D don't you? I, I want to be ready. I, I want to be able to give him gifts and, and honor him. And I, and I want him to say, Rick, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into joy. I've said this often. I, I don't want, when I stand, you know, come walking up. I don't know if it's a walkway and Jesus sitting on a throne. I don't know how this is going to work. It's not St. Peter at the gate going, what's the password, right? But, but coming in the presence of God. I don't want Jesus to see me coming down that walkway or whatever and go, could you come in the back door? I don't want anybody to see you. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into joy. I want to say, come on, my, my boy, I, I, I've been waiting for you. I don't want to be ashamed at his coming. I, 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 want, to, I want to see Jesus and all that he is and, and want to be able to stand before him in grace and in truth. Ladies and gentlemen, we... We hear all these things of Bible prophecy and when's Jesus coming and all that kind of stuff. And it seems distant, it seems way out there kind of thing. But let me tell you something. The coming of Jesus, whether I, come, I die and go to see him or he comes to get me, it is powerful and real and will happen to every one of us at one point. And if you claim to be a follower of Jesus, you need to say what you need to say. You need to do what you need to do. In relationships, and your money and finances, and in, in, in your relationship with God, this is big and powerful enough that this isn't something we just pass by. Oh, what is, Rick's message was so nice. He was so funny during some of that. Oh, it was great. I, I don't want this to be that kind of message. I, I want you to be able to feel the weight of this and say, either I'm going to see him or he's coming to get me. My life ought to be different. My priorities ought to be different that I need to take advantage of, of having the conversation with my kids or grandkids who I've never said to this to them, but I want to be able to say to them, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And maybe with tears in your eyes, maybe you need to share the good news of Jesus with your children, grandchildren, or maybe great-grandchildren. Maybe there's somebody in your life you need to go to and forgive. And maybe there's somebody you need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe you need to look at your finances and say, you know what, I, we're consuming all this on us. Where are we giving any to God? And maybe you need to look at your life and say, you know what, if God says, be holy as I am holy, where in your life are the limitations or the barriers or the things that are holding you back from being all in with Him? Because you are only as close to God as you want to be. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. You know, the scriptures say that a special crown will be given, maybe the crown of life will be given to those who look forward to his coming. Some scholars say it's, it's a crown, that crown of salvation that everyone will receive. And some people write that there's a special reward of some kind. I don't know if it's a, a crown we wear for a limited amount of time. It says crown. But whatever it is, there is a special designation for those who are looking. Say, you know what? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come I want to give my life back to you as, a, as an offering of grace. As John writes the end of the book of the Revelation, he says, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, that that would be our prayer and that it would change our decisions, it would change our speech, and it would change our actions. Ladies and gentlemen, say what you need to say. And in light of his return, do what you need to do. Let's pray together. God, I feel the weight of this. I feel the weight of having some conversations I don't want to have. I feel the weight of this that there are some conversations I should have had a long time ago, some thank yous I needed to say or some honor I needed to give. But God, in light of your return or me going to see you, I'm not guaranteed tomorrow. In light of that, God, help me today to do the things I need to do and say and have the conversations I need to have. God, help me to be right with you and right with other people. God, my finances are a reflection of, of my priorities. Oh, God, help me to 
Help me to invest them in your kingdom and in other people. God, thank you for being so good and kind to us. We don't deserve your mercy, but you give it because of Jesus. You love us and you forgive us because of him. And God, we thank you today. Lord, there are people sitting in here or watching online that need to have a renewed relationship with you. God, I pray that you come. They come to you. Father, forgive them and help set them free. There are those of us, God, who are trying to follow you. Lord, I pray that you fill us with your spirit and help us to do these things that are so hard. Help us with reckless abandon to trust you into the unknown and trust you for these things. We love you, God. Help us to look forward to your coming. And we pray this in Jesus' name.